Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is September 21st, 2014, and uh, assuming I get this up today like I planned to, you might be saying, holy crap, Michael, are you really planning on recording all of them like live, and why did it take you so damn long to get the first one recorded? The answer is, you'll notice starting with the next one that the dates go back in time because we had another event occur where there was a book that happened uh, completely earlier than I thought it did, which I think is the case with the next one as well. I've got my notes over here. Uh, the, the part of the part of the next one occurred much earlier than I realized. So here's the thing: the list that we're using for some reason has Undead and Unholy parts two and three of the Haunted Lands trilogy on it. But for some reason, Unclean isn't on there. Though if you dig into its, like, page that has more details about Haunted Lands, it tells quite obviously that Unclean happens in 1375, Year of Risen Elfkin, which is true. All throughout the book, the notes, or, or the, the chapter headings, are specific dates within the Year of Risen Elfkin. So, we're going to talk about that today. Oh, very quickly, let's go ahead and get uh, a couple of anthologies out of the way. The anthologies are going to be kind of out of order, but honestly, since I'm basically skipping both of them, Realms of the Dragons and Realms of the Dragons 2, who cares, right? Realms of the Dragons has that uh, interesting story in it that ties into Paul S. Kemp's Kale, or, well, I guess technically the um, uh, Shadow War trilogy. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting and provides some backstory on the dragon they work with, and those horrible clerics refuse to, to heal, but it's kind of the standout of it. And um, I'll admit I preferred uh, Realms of the Dragons 2 a little bit more because Realms of the Dragons 1 seems to be like, yeah, roar, dragons, and Realms of the Dragons 2, especially the first story, which is about a fairy dragon, seems to be much more interested in kind of coming at dragons from a different angle. And I just find dragons really dull in general. I, I, I generally only enjoy them as supporting roles or whatever, and since, you know, this is an anth two anthologies about dragons, it's like every story basically needs to feature a dragon in some way, shape, or form, and that just made it really dull for me. Another thing I really hate, zombies. <laughs> so... My, and, and if you've listened to this for a while, you know that I'm not a huge Byers fan, so you might be surprised to learn that I actually really enjoyed Unclean. The uh, the cover and the little blurb on the back are, are like the best parts about it, and I was really excited to find out that that blurb actually does play into the story. Whilst looking for an email address for Richard Lee Byers, which I could not find, very frustrating. He he seems very active on the web, and he, he speaks on Candlekeep Forum quite a bit, but I tried to private message him there. He's disabled that, understandable. You know, if there's any chance that you hear this, Richard, please uh, write me. Uh, I would love to do an interview with you about the Haunted Lands trilogy, because uh, a lot going on here. This, of course, is one of the trilogies that brings us into 4th edition. We're not there yet, obviously, but it's it's going to, like, especially the fact that book 3 takes place 100 years later, <laughs> it's going to be part of the transition. And so I just have tons of questions about that. On the topic of which, you can see that uh, they're already laying some of the foundation for that transition. I highlighted this little note. But the effects of arcane magic, partaking as it did of primordial chaos. Now that's, unless I am completely and absolutely wrong or crazy or whatever, that idea of arcane magic being a primordial power, uh, I don't, I don't think we've seen that anywhere before, and I think that's laying the framework for the new way to think of power sources come 4th edition. I, I thought Arcane was its own power source. I, I, I've only played a little bit of 4th edition, and it's like mostly I have dealt with the setting rather than the, the rules. I mean, I know that everything has its own power source, and uh, the Primordials are one, but as I say, I thought Arcane was another one of the power sources. I could be wrong. If somebody wants to feel free to fact-check me there. Jump in. But again, he's writing this at, at the outset of... You know, I, I don't believe 4th Ed had come out at the time that this was written. 
or even published. So it could be that this was kind of a... Uh, uh, they knew they were going to have the power sources, but it wasn't quite nailed down what belonged to what yet at that point. I'd be very curious to ask about that. I'll go ahead and go through the other little things that I marked here just for fun, and, and then we'll get into talking about the story. I, 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 don't, I don't think these necessarily spoil anything here. This is just a bit of... <laughs> <laughs> misplaced modifiers, I think is the term for this, when when your commas and your phrases kind of get out of control. Though we'd known her for 20 years, Asnar Thrall had never beheld the face of Shabella, High Priestess of Mask, God of Larceny and Shadow, and Mistress of the Thieves' Guild of Besantour. Now, obviously, he's saying Mask is the God of Larceny and Shadow, not that this is another descriptor for Shabella, but because it's just three commas and it sounds as if it's making a list, it certainly reads as if Shabella is the god of larceny and shadow, and also the mistress of the Thieves' Guild of Bezentor. Unless maybe there was something that happened behind the scenes where she took over Mask's job and I missed it. Also, here's a, a fun way to get around saying sex outrightly in your Realms novel, as you've probably noticed from the way that Greenwood writes and and others as well, they will do a hell of a lot of wink-wink, nudge-nudge, but it's very rare that you get just straight-up sex described. Here is the line, By all accounts, Thrall had even been preparing for coition. Coition? I don't know how to pronounce that. It's a, it's a form of coitus, but obviously with eon at the end, it's coition, or a perverse alternative to it. So coition is the act of coitus, which coitus is the act of coitus as well, so I'm not sure why there's another word for that. But, here at Realms Remembered, we strive to teach you new vocabulary. <laughs> Coom and coition. Co coition. However that's pronounced. New word of the day for you. Use that with your friends, not not your family. Also, I made a note of my favorite character, Mollark Springhill. Uh, very interesting backstory. Byers, I think, is generally a little weak on the character department, having characters that really stand out. Even the ones who I like are usually kind of uh, uh, cut from cloth. Like, for instance, Barreras in here, who's kind of our main heroic character, one of two at least, uh, has these things that you should feel very deeply about, but I just don't because he feels so kind of cookie cutter, yet Malark, who only has maybe three or four scenes, really stands out to me, and his backstory is just awesome and something I hadn't seen before, and I really enjoyed it. So, you know, but that being said, again, he's only in here three or four scenes, but I'm assuming he's going to play a larger role in the later books. This is essentially a, a, a political thriller, I guess if you will, and also a political allegory for either Germany in the late 30s or the U.S. at the time that this was written, take your pick, whatever. It's it's not really revealed that that's the case until about chapter 12 or 13 or so, about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through the book. What it is for the first half is just kind of all these characters and all these situations thrown at you, and you have to kind of figure out what's going on. Like, every review that I have seen about this book complains about the fact that there are so many characters. I did not mind that at all. I thought it was very obvious from the outset that the characters we were meant to follow and kind of uh, associate with are Barreras, who's a returning bard who's been out adventuring, and he obviously seems like a good guy, right? I mean, that's a, a good guy, and, and that's kind of your cue in the realms, like, oh, I need to follow this character. Also, uh, I think his name is Auth, Auth, which seems a little weird because the first part of his name is the same as their main god, Ayo. That's how I always pronounce it in my head, Ayo, the god of all, which is a little weird when you think of it because I guess it's kind of like being named Yahweh Seth or something in the modern world, but it's still not as weird as Faerun. I will argue that till the day I die, most likely. In any case, this is all about uh, Zaztam, whose name is really difficult to say, so I'm just going to call him Sassy. This is all about Sassy's bid for more power. In Thay, it's very unclear exactly why he's doing this, since essentially he has about as much power as you can get in Thay. I'm still not 100% clear on all of the political uh, hierarchy that exists in Thay, though I don't think this book needed to explain that, but essentially there are a bunch of Zulkirs, and I believe Sassy is like the first amongst many of the Zulkirs. 
but they obviously get to vote on things and so on and so forth. And so that's what my last note pertains to is his uh, reasoning for doing this because it does seem pointless. It does seem needless. It seems needless. Here at the very end of the book, Someone asks him, I think it's in fact Malaric asks him, why must you wear an actual crown even if it brings ruin on the land? Sassy hesitated. It's a little complicated. And that's the only hint that we get that at least there is reasoning behind it. I'm assuming that the later books will go into it, though I felt very wronged <laughs> when listening to Year of Rogue Dragons because Samister, the kind of big bad behind uh, pulling the strings in there. Never got a lot of uh, backstory, and, and uh, uh, we, as much as we read his notes throughout the books, he, I, I never felt like he was formed completely as a character as much as that first epilogue really pointed towards, and that made me sad. You know, and somebody like Sassy, it's, it's, he's, he's kind of like Strahd in a way, right? It's like finding out his backstory or... <sighs> I guess because everybody liked Ice Strahd, I guess finding out his his stats, you know, nobody liked when that happened, right? You, you, you don't want the mysterious puppet master to be statted out and, and made weak in a way that you can take him down, unless, of course, that happens. But I believe the end of this uh, trilogy is that he does gain more control and he's just master of an undead empire or whatever. But I'm not 100% sure, so I guess we'll find out along the way. At least this first one. Uh, you know, I also read some other people complaining that overall this was just a little too dismal for them. And I'll admit, there's, there's a lot of dismay. I was kind of surprised that it went as hardcore as it did with some of the uh, deaths and ramifications of those deaths. But uh, Byers has said that he's a, a horror fan and enjoys putting horror into things that he writes, and you can definitely feel that here, and I'm okay with that. But at the end of the day, essentially the big battle that we have towards the end of the book does get won at, you know, at a high cost, but still it does get won. So it feels to me like at least book one, we aren't in tragedy territory yet, uh, except on the personal side. So yeah, I skipped a lot of the bits where they're fighting in the first half because it just seemed like, okay, I... I, I know that they're all going to discuss what happened <laughs> and talk about the ramifications, which is what I'm more interested in, and they did. Uh, again, there are a lot of characters, but I, I didn't mind that. The, the one thing that I kept uh, thinking was weird is everybody keeps talking about the murder of Druxus Reem, and I was like, man, why does that name seem so familiar? And after I finished, I started it over again, and I realized he's killed in the prologue, and I had totally forgotten about him, and so it's like, oh, that's where I know the name from, because I was like... Is this from a, another buyer's book or something? But no, that's, that's where it comes from. Overall, I'm really excited about this trilogy. I am honestly really excited about the transition to 4th Ed in general. I think the realms could use a shakeup. I did not exactly enjoy the uh, only 4th Ed book that I tried reading, but I'm willing to give it another go. I didn't enjoy this book the first time that I tried reading it. It just seemed so... I don't know, what's the opposite of twee, you know? Like, it just seemed, especially the opening, it just seemed so like, I'm sassy, and I pull every puppet string out there. Ah, ha, ha, ha. But uh, sassy, much like Malark, only shows up in really three or four scenes. They're very important scenes for the most part, and they set the stage. But since he shows up in the prologue, and I just felt like, this guy's, you know, he's going to pull a rabbit out of his hat at every turn. I'm not really interested in the whole book about that. But that's not what we get at all. All right, I think I've touched on everything that I meant to there. Coming up next time, we'll be talking about Stardeep and the Stone of Tamora trilogy. That's the one that uh, I'm covering way later than I should. And I, I think we'll end out this... With all the reshuffling, if my calculations are correct, we'll be hitting 4th Ed, or at least the end of 3rd, somewhere around Part 3 of the next block. So... Not really as close as I thought we were, but not very far away. Very exciting. I hope you guys are excited. Oh, and just a very quick note. <laughs> I always think I'm going to get these out faster, and then something always comes up. Just in case you were curious, I had a kidney stone. Very horrible in a place that they had to do the really painful procedure on. If you know what I'm talking about, then you're wincing. And if you don't, don't bother looking it up because it's terrible and horrifying and ugh. 
I had like three weeks at least where basically like moving was difficult, uh, and uh, that, that that's that's no that's not a fun place to be in, and that kind of pushed things back. And then for a while after that, I was like, I'm only reading fantasy from the '80s because it's so relaxing and like nothing really happens, and it's just kind of people hanging out and walking around and talking to people, and it's not even necessarily stuff that I would like generally, but it really appealed to me at that point. <laughs> So don't judge, damn it. Also, I'm on Goodreads if you want to follow my adventures through 80s fantasy or whatever. Then feel free to join me over there. And my 10th audiobook that I've performed is now out. So please feel free to look me up on Audible, iTunes, or Amazon. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.